do see that you can see before I hit the stop? By taking part in this project, I am agreeing to my image and voice being used for any appropriate and relevant purposes as seen fit by the Inverclyde Community Development Trust and being stored in an archive which will be made available to the public. Thank you. So I understand your mother immigrated to Scotland from Germany to live. Do you know why? She came over to marry my dad. They met uh, after the war. My dad was a soldier stationed near my mum and that's how they met and she came over in 1948 and they were married. So what, what kind of jobs did your parents do? Did your mum work? When she came over here she got a job in the mill in Port Glasgow as a bleacher. There was a German man who was the manager, the supervisor in the bleaching room. I don't know if that's why she got the job but um, that's where she started off working when she came here. My dad was a timekeeper in the yard, I think. What age was she when she came over here? Um, 22, I think. And was she, was, were they married in Germany? No, no, they were married no, here in St John's in Port Glasgow. What was your childhood like? Well, I loved my mum being German. I loved um, learning a, new, a different language. Well, it was, it was normal to me. Um, I liked all the things that went with that, with my mum being German, but the downside was um, I was called a Jerry and a Nazi right through my school life until about fifth year, I think. I still got that, you know, and it did bother me sometimes when I was younger, but as I got older, I just thought, well, you know, I didn't mind the Jerry, but I hated the Nazi bit, you know, that seemed a bit more extreme. Yeah. And, uh, with some people painted swastikas outside their front door and, you know, gave us a hard time. You know. But when my mum first came over here, she didn't get a hard time. That's the time you would have expected it, you know, um, just after the war when feelings would still be running high. But they were very, very welcoming. And I think she was seen as a bit of um, a novelty, you know, the wee German woman in the fort. But uh, yeah, it was in the 60s when I was born that my brother and sister both got it as well. And, sadly, two of my children were called a Nazi and a Jerry as well. The youngest one hasn't as yet, but she's just about to do a project and she's writing a biography on my mum and I just wonder when people, maybe she hasn't told them my mum's German, you know, mm -hmm. or grand, but we'll see. You know, it's mm -hmm. quite sad really, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know. What did your mum think of all that when it was happening in the 60s? Well, she went and spoke to, there was one boy in particular in the school who called me a Jerry all the time. She went and spoke to his mum, but it didn't really stop it, you know. And I do remember her shouting somebody who said to me, you should be living in a German Nazi war camp. And I thought, I didn't even know what it was. So I went in and I said, what is this? And my mother, I remember my mother flying out the door and saying, she was born in this house, she's as Scottish as you are, you know. But um, obviously they'd heard that about it or something in the home, a child, and they were younger than me and I didn't know about what that was, you know, but my grandfather was in a concentration camp, so, but he was a commie, <laughs> not a Jew. <laughs> what was your mum's life like before she came here? My mum um, talked a lot about her life, you know, um, she was called up at 18. She was in the army. She was, well, probably it was the, I don't know if it was the RAF. She, RAF, they don't call it that, do they? Um, the Air Force. She was a porter. You know the women you see with the headsets and they're shoving wee planes about and measuring where the planes are? That's what my mum did. And uh, if it hadn't been wartime, I think she would have enjoyed the army. You know, she quite liked certain aspects of it, but the fact that it was war obviously was a different story, you know. But um, just before the Americans advanced, her commanding officer said to them, ditch your uniforms, put your civvy clothes on and get out of here. Go, because we're going to be overtaken and we don't want to be captured as a, as a soldier. So just go. And it took, I think, four days to walk home. And it was quite um, a horrific journey for her. Certainly a lot of different things happened, you know. So um, she lost a brother during the war as well. 
missing through doing bed, which is horrible because they've never had closure. You know, they've always hoped that he was alive somewhere, but I don't think they knew. You know, mm. he, and if he was, he may well have died by now because he would be eighty three, eighty four. You know, but that was hard, and that that happened on all sides for me too. You know, so I it was um, a nice life until the war broke out. You know, so. And when Hitler first came to power, she said that he was very good. He did a lot of good stuff for the German people, but obviously it's how he funded it. That's when he, he went a bit, as she says, real <laughs> Um And that changed things, yeah. So war life was really bad then? Well, parts of it were. Um, my grandfather, my upper, as we call him, he was communist and he was sent to concentration camp for a number of years. And when he came home, he said, you will see and hear things that you will not believe were possibly happening under your nose in, in Germany, because propaganda was telling them, this is what the British are doing to us, when it was actually the Nazis were doing to their own and to the Jews, you know. But you have to remember in those days there weren't television and you know, all they had really was radio and leaflets and they had like the Pathé News stuff that came on at the cinemas. So that that's the only thing that the anybody had really at their disposal. It's not the way it is nowadays, you know. So they could control it a lot more, let's just say that. What was her life like before the war? What was her childhood like? Did she ever tell you about that? She she had a fairly normal childhood. Well, to, to some extent, um, there were difficulties in the home um, from my grandfather, which weren't very nice, but on the whole, where my mum stayed was a, is a, is a beautiful little town, you know, um, and they lived in a building, well, they originally lived in an old building, my mum's house was the only house in Gerritsheim that was bombed, you know, Dusseldorf took it quite bad and that, that was quite near, it was part of the Dusseldorf area. But um, they reckon it was a stray bomb, and they saw it coming, and they they all get out except my grandfather. He decided, oh, I'm not going because every time they heard the siren and they all get out, he's like, oh, it's nothing. But he stayed in the house. But um, he was okay. He was he was blown out of the house. <laughs> but um, they did lose. Um, I'm saying that they all get out. No, they didn't. My mum's cousin was a baby. And the wee boy was killed, um, and they all come off warboard, went to Egypt. So they did lose a couple of people, actually, if I got that wrong. Um, but prior to the war, um, beautiful place she lived, you know, really lovely and quite an, an idyllic childhood in many ways, except for some of the difficulties in the home. But the actual town and everything is, and it still is, it's lovely. Yeah. What, what is the town called? Gerisheim. Gerisheim. <clears throat> Did you, as a family, go and visit your mother's family in Germany? Yeah, we went as often as we could. My grand sometimes sent us tickets because we couldn't always afford it, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, we went as often and we stayed the whole summer, the whole holidays. It was great. I loved it. Um, and in between times, aunts and uncles came here. So if we weren't there, somebody was here. So it was great. Yeah, loved it. So do you, you still visit them today then? I haven't been for a, a couple of years now, yeah. But I've still went with my family, mm -hmm. you know, my children. Uh, I was there, and it's five years since I've been. And I do miss it, because it's a second home to me. I just love it. Love it. We did think about moving over there, but my husband doesn't speak German. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when he was with IBM, uh, they had a place in Strasbourg, I think, and uh, or Freiburg. And uh, we did think about moving there because they all spoke English, you know, IBM is this. Because Eddie, my husband, really, really liked the black boys as well. But something you've got to do when your children are young. Mm. So, you know. <laughs> is there any traditions that your mum carried on here from Germany through the family? Well, we stick to the tradition of putting the Christmas tree up on Christmas Eve. Um, and I still do that to this day, and we've always had a real tree, we've never had an artificial tree. And um, we ha always had St Nicholas plates, which were put out on the 6th of December, that's St Nicholas 
okay and uh, what, what you get in that for us anyway it was uh, nuts and fruit and things like that we didn't get our presents I know that Germans do but my mum never did that she always just stuck to the Christmas presents you know but we always knew we were getting an extra treat kids nowadays don't realise we only got those nuts and things at Christmas time we didn't get mixed nuts and tangerines at any other time of the year you know so we did that um, she used to keep the light I feel dangerous but she used to keep the lights of the tree on all night and that was to guide you know um, what was it she used to say that was to guide the Christmas angels you know but my dad used to stay up I think before the tree went on fire <laughs> this is a photo <laughs> But um, we still do that, we still have a little tree and we still have it up on Christmas Eve and my kids have got St Nicholas cakes as well. So, um, There's not really any other kind of German traditions, I wouldn't say, that we kept, no. Were any sort of holidays different? Um, like Easter, Hogmanay? Yeah, no. I think my mum tried to kind of fit in more with here. Right. You know what I mean? With the odd thing. So she just sort of adapted to traditional food? I think so. My gran used to send a parcel quite often, but Christmas parcels were always very exciting, you know. And I remember um, my sister, my brother and I <laughs> having to stand and my mum would draw around our feet on a piece of cardboard and she would label it and send it to my gran and she would send us shoes. And they were always quite different from the shoes you got here. And sometimes we didn't want to wear them because we thought, well, they're too different, you know. They were lovely, but we probably just thought they were a wee bit too different, you know. But we were made to wear them, whether we wanted to or not. So I always remember that, getting, getting our feet drawn round and uh, getting measured, you know, that my gran would send stuff. And she would send us, um, oh, she would send snaps for my dad. Uh, and she would send food, which I don't think you can now. But she would send us like German sausage and... And um, German crisps, which were different from here, and just uh, marzipan and different chocolates and stuff like that. So it was just very exciting, you know. Yeah. Okay, and that's what we always used to. That is a German tradition, actually. The chocolates went on the tree, and on twelfth night we got to raise the tree and eat oh. the chocolates. So I still do that too. That's good. Was there any family recipes? that have been passed down? Well, my mum's got a very special um, red cabbage recipe. Um, and I know you can kind of get it now, you know, but um, it's it was very different because it had apples and cider, vinegar and everything in it. Very, very good. And um, different types of kind of stews and, and our baking was quite different. Uh, Apfel streusel kuchen, as, it, as it's known. Um, Connie makes it as well. It's um, a kind of crumble, apple crumble cake. You know, so that was quite different, things like that she made. But my mum learned from um, my aunt and my gran here as well, because my dad wanted mums and daughters, you know. <laughs> so we got a bit of everything, if you like. Have you done any family history research? And if you have, what have you found out so far that was of interest to you? My grandfather did years ago. Um, I would love to see that. I've never seen it as such. And it was before the, the internet and everything, but he, my mum's own name is Hayden, or some people say it Hayden, because you know how names, um, when people couldn't write, they were written down in different ways. So you've probably heard of the composer, um, Hayden. Well, that's one of our ancestors, and there's also an artist, as far as I know. And my grandfather was very very musical and very artistic so I can see where the genes have gone there you know and my children are as well so um, we are related to him but that's as much as I know but my grandfather and grandmother divorced and he remarried and he's got nine children so my mum's got nine half brothers and sisters um, as well as her full brothers and sisters and um, I would love to see if they still have any of that research, you know. It would be a good starting point with the internet, you know. Well, that was quite far back from then. They did really well, you know. But that's that's all I know about that one. My great-granny, didn't know that yet, my great-granny was a Polish gypsy. She 
she was from the German Poland Sporta. So that much I do know and her my mum's step granda if you like, she was from Cincinnati. So she was from a blood relative. So so I have a an uncle. <laughs> Is there stuff that you still want to continue? Yeah, I would love to find out more why. Yep. Yep. The last time I was here, um, I remember we talked about, um, what was it, a, a place run, run by nuns that your mother was involved in? Schoenstatt. That's it. Yeah, the Schoenstatt sisters uh, were sent here to minister to German war brides, basically. Um, they were very good to my mum in helping her to get on and inviting her. They had mass in German and they would send her German calendars and, and little German treats and things like that, you know, mm -hmm. and they would come and visit and see how she was getting on. They were coping with learning the language as well. I think they were here to help. But my mum... My mum hardly spoke any English when she came here. My dad hardly spoke any German. I don't know how they got on, you know. <laughs> but, um, well, <laughs> ah, well, indeed. <laughs> uh, it's blind, eh? <laughs> but, um, she just had to learn, flung in at the deep end, you know. So, um, she does. It's difficult for me to know what kind of accent my mum's got, because to me, that's my mum, mm. you know. But anybody meeting my mum for the first time, a lot of people think she's a Highlander or an Irish person. Mm. And it's probably because of the mixture of the German and Scots action, accent, you know. But she does have, she does say things with a Scottish accent, of course she does. She's been here 60 odd years, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But um, she couldn't read or write. She taught herself, her and my dad, between them, you know, helped her with that. And my mum does very, very well, indeed, from a thin corner, you know. Mm -hmm. And having had all of it, you know, it couldn't have been easy. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have been easy. So she's technically lived here longer than Germany then? Absolutely. But she still says, home is Germany. I'm going home. Yeah. And that's Germany, you know. But she's been a British citizen since 1948. But <laughs> she never ever held dual nationality. Yeah. No. I think it, that, that was too... Um, I think it might have given her problems at that time. I don't think it would now, but I think it would have then. Yeah. It was easier to become a British citizen. But it had three weeks when she came here. She had three weeks to make up her mind. Did she want to stay or did she want to go? They would have paid for her to go back. But if she stayed longer than that, she would want to leave. You know. But she had quite a bit of difficulty getting all the papers to come here. Her parish priest wasn't going to sign it. Why not? Well... Probably to do with religion, sadly. Um, he didn't believe that my father was Catholic because Scotland wasn't a Catholic country. And uh, my granny, I think, was saying to him, don't sign that. I don't want my daughter to go. It was nothing to do with religion or her, you know. But, um, but my dad had to prove who he was and his religion and everything, you know. <laughs> and... Um, the telegram came to tell my mum everything had been approved and that she was to go and pick up her travel documents and everything. And my gran didn't give her it for a few days. So she found it, it must have been hard for her, you know, to let her go. But she did eventually give her it, but she had to tell my mum up in Hayden for a few days. <laughs> yeah. I suppose she'd lost her son to the yeah. war and losing her daughter to the unknown. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, how do you think your life has shaped you as a person? Oh, I loved it. I loved having a German mother. I loved it being a bit different. You know, I hated the, the name calling, but um, I loved the fact that we had slightly different food because we used to eat salami and everything when folk didn't know what it was, you know. And I can remember having packed lunches you know, if you went a school trip, then they would always say, what have you got in there? What's that, you know? Because they would have, I don't know, peas and jam or something, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, and we would have different stuff, and we just thought it was normal, you know? And I can remember meeting 
um, sandwiches when I played hockey in school and they had to bring sandwiches for you and the person in the other team. And I remember this girl turning my mother's at it and thinking, what is that, you know? And I thought, see, then I'll eat them myself. <laughs> and I ate them, you know, but I remember just thinking, oh, what's this funny stuff, you know? Because <laughs> they'd never seen it, mm -hmm. as simple as that. Nowadays, everything would be all delivered. Yeah. But you've got to remember, we're talking about 1972, you know what I mean? You didn't, you didn't get a lot of funny stuff here, you know? My mum used to go, there was a, there was a shop in Glasgow, um, I don't remember, it wasn't in the city centre, but it wasn't far from it, that sold all the German sausages and bread and all that, and we used to go there when she could afford it, you know, we'd go up and just buy, buy wee supplies, but it was very much rationed, you couldn't just get tore in, you, we always asked, can I have a bit of that, mm -hmm. you know, so that everybody in the family got shared. <laughs> So how, how did things differ between German life and Scottish life? Was there any major differences that you noticed? Um, just that summer, when we went to Germany, it was very, very different. You know, it was exciting on the journey, but I had cousins my own age over there that I didn't have here because my dad was the youngest in the family, so my cousins were all a lot older. So I, I, w I had more freedom over there, I would say. We had cycle tracks over there in the 60s and 70s, do you know, that we, we didn't have here. So you could safely go on a bike, even though you were on the opposite side of the road, if you like. You could safely go on a bike anywhere you wanted. And I remember going, being sent down for a crate of beer at 10 years of age, you know, with the, you had the crate, the empty bottles, because you got money back on the bottles, the way we did on lemonade. And I remember my cousin and I strapping it onto the back of the bike and cycling down and the men, the man in the corner shop giving us a ten, a crate of beer, you know. Um, and that was okay, you know, walking home with this crate of beer with my think on it now. But um, th these were the things that were different. Mm -hmm. Fashions were different. They always seemed to be a wee bit ahead of us because I can remember coming home with straight leg trousers that were um, not, were unheard of here, you know, everybody was still wearing the big flares. And, and people, and I was 17 at that time, and I remember people making fun of me, you know, oh, what kind of trousers has she got on, you know? And within a few weeks, they were all wearing them, you know, wearing clogs that people weren't mm -hmm. wearing here. So we, we always had slightly different clothes, and toys were different. We had things that, roller skates were fantastic over there, you know? And I remember my sister and I having these cracking ro roller skates that went like a bomb, you know? Nearly killed us a few times, but and I remember we had um, a German scooter with flags on it, and um, nearly killed all three of us that scooter because it was so fast. But everybody wanted a shot of this scooter because it had big wheels, were unlike the scooters we had here. Mm. So there was things like that. And when my cousins came, we were the most popular family in the street because everybody wanted because there were all the Germans were here, you know, and everybody. It was nice. Mm. There was no bad feeling when they were here. It was really strange that the bad feeling was aimed at us mm. when they weren't here, but when they were here it was another thing. And everybody wanted a wee piece and everybody wanted to play with them, you know? Yeah, and it was nice, but yeah, when they weren't here it wasn't so nice. But do you know what? It didn't um, damage us, it didn't taint us in any way. Um, we learned to get over it and they could have been calling us worse things. It did upset me when they called me a Nazi because Thought, wait a minute, my grandfather was in concentration camps, you know, and um, he was arrested for the Nazis, so how dare you call me a Nazi? A Jerry, I could get, you know, a German, but the Nazi bit kind of did upset me, and it upset me even more that two of my girls were called Nazis. I thought, jeez, oh, in this generation, I didn't think yeah. it would keep going, but... I can't believe it's still being carried on now. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, I liked it. I liked um. Well, she's my mum, and I love her, and and she is what she is, you know. But it was nice. Um, I can only think all the good stuff that we got from it, you know. Mm. All the bad stuff was minute compared to what's going on now. So yeah, my mum um did think about going back to Germany a few times because my dad uh, couldn't find employment, and he he wasn't he didn't enjoy the best of health many years and he'd, he would have gone in a minute but 
he was getting older and that as I say it's harder when you're children are getting older. When my dad died when I was 15, my mother talked about going back to Germany and I panicked because at 15 I didn't want to do it. I thought my life's here, you know, my friends are here, I don't want to go with it. Different um, education system and everything, you know, and as much as I could speak German, I couldn't read and write it enough to cope, you know, uh, and I did panic, but that was just a knee jerk because my father died and, you know, it shouldn't have done. But um, she did think about it and I understand it, you know. She's got two brothers left and then half brothers and sisters. So she's only got two full brothers left and they've got a mum. And she went back in October, which was good. And she could still speak the language, which is great. But she's getting older and sometimes we lose our language as, as people get older, you know. But when she first when I went into labour with my youngest daughter and I went to wake my mother up and she sat up and spoke to me in German and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Her brain hadn't engaged, maybe, do you know what I mean? It was interesting that her first language was German. So I spoke back and said, I'm in labour, I'm going to the hospital. And then she said, why are you speaking German to me? And I said, because you're speaking to me, <laughs> you know. But um, I thought that was quite interesting. And we have asked her, when did you stop thinking in German and yeah. translating in your head? Because if I speak German, I'm thinking in English and I'm translating in my head, although the words that are coming out are German. And she can't even remember, you know. I said, when did you stop dreaming in German? Do you know? These, yeah. are, these are things you don't think about when you've got another language. But she says she thinks in English now, except yeah. when she's over there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But it's an interesting concept, I think, you know. That's strange. Yeah. I mean, I don't... I remember being 12, I think, when we were in Germany. And, and as much as we went out to play, and that's how you learn the lingo, isn't it? You know, you learn from other children. And it's amazing. Children transcend any language barrier at all. They get by with sign language and just learning by watching, you know? So we went out and played, and there wasn't... I don't remember there being any difficulties at all. You know, knowing what they were saying, you know. Um, but I do remember sitting in adult company when I was 12 and thinking, whoa, I understand everything here. The penny just kind of dropped. And I was under, they didn't think I could understand it all. And I, rem and I remember commenting on something that they said and they get put out the room and they think, oh, she oh. understands that because it was adult conversation, yeah. you know, and I get put out. I, I let, I let slip that I could <laughs> understand. And I remember getting thrown out, you know. But um, it's funny that, that I, that's the time I remember the penny dropping and thinking, I'm really getting all this here, yeah. more than before, you know. So I speak slang. I don't speak proper German because I only know what I've learned mm -hmm. from being out playing in the street and from my family and neighbours of theirs, you know. So I don't speak the proper, I couldn't be on the telly, let's put it that way. Um, and I probably know a lot of what's called Dusseldorf or flat. It's, it's a slang which is um, specific to that area. So I remember going to the Black Forest and asking, you know, the woman, do you have a, a room key, a, a, a wee bed and breakfast kind of farmhouse? And she said no. And then she said, well, oh, where, are you from the north? And I thought she meant Scotland. And I said, no, no, I'm from west of Scotland. And she said, no, northern Germany. You've got a Rhineland accent. And I thought... Well, that's weird. I never thought about speaking yeah. German in an accent, but they're very different. In the Black Forest, it's, very, it's like Aberdeen and us, you know, it's yeah. very different. Um, and she said, no, no, I can hear it. I can hear the Rhineland. And, and then I said where my mum was from, and she said, oh, yeah, Dusseldorf, I hear it. I said, well, you don't even realise you're picking that up, you know. I think you're sounding dead Scottish. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Caroline. It's been really good. Welcome. Oh. Thank you.